Today is the day the passion bubbles over. Five months of leaving your blood, sweat, and heart on the floor can culminate with an invitation to the NCAA tournament. It's also a tense, nerve-wracking, acid reflux-inducing kind of day as the bubble teams hope that they've solved bracketology. Welcome to ESPNU Bracketology, presented by Staples. The best way to rest easy on Selection Sunday, the automatic bid and in the Southland, Northwestern State, who beat Iowa last year, bounced by Texas A&M Corpus Christi. They're going to the dance for the first time ever. It has been full-fledged Division I since 2002. In the ACC, North Carolina beat upstart and game NC State 89-80. First time since 98 that the Tar Heels have cut down the ACC tournament nets. Roy Williams hoping he's done enough to get a number one seed. So too are the Florida Gators against Arkansas in the SEC. Gators win their third straight tournament title. Joe Kim Noah with the stuff. And then Joe Kim, do they, they have, I don't, I don't know, is, is there some type of medication involved in? 3756. Putting the moves on in the Big Ten, Wisconsin and Ohio State. Ron Lewis, so much talk about the freshmen. The veterans have stepped up for the Bucks too. They take care of business against Wisconsin, 66 to 49. The final there, the Buckeyes are the champions of the Big Ten tournament. Glad to have you along with us. We're counting down for the field of 65 being unveiled. Hubert Digger, Jay, I'm Reese. Glad to have you along with us. And guys, we look at it right now. There are some teams sweating, as you see on the side and the bottom of your screen. Continue to get information throughout this episode of Bracketology, Sports Center, and then Bracketology after Sports Center at 7 Eastern. The way we have it figured, between the automatic qualifiers and the teams that are locked, 61 spots have been claimed, four at large spots available, 12 teams vying for them right now. And so we bring in our certified bracketologist, Joe Lenardi, who's been following this thing on a minute-by-minute -minute basis, making changes. Joe, this is your last shot. Last four in, last four out. We're going to go with Purdue to head the list and then add Stanford, Drexel, and Arkansas. These are the teams sweating on the right side of the bubble. And then just out, K-State, Old Dominion, Illinois, and Florida State. As always, you can make quality arguments for and against any of these teams. It's individual committee member preference. All right, Joe, plenty from Joe Lenardi over the next three hours, Bracketology and Sports Center combined. Guys, as Joe said, you can make a lot of good arguments for any of these teams, so let's go ahead and start making some of them right now by playing some in or out. Let's start with a team from the Colonial Athletic Association, Old Dominion, in or out, Hubert? I have Old Dominion out. They were 3-1 and one in the Colonial Athletic Conference. Big win against Georgetown, but huge losses versus Virginia Tech, Clemson, Maris, Winthrop, and lost early in their tournament. Yeah, even though they won 12 in a row, the loss to George Mason really hurts. I have them out. Jay, you can have them next. I've got them in because they're better than Drexel. They beat Georgetown at Georgetown. They beat Drexel twice. They were 4-2 and two against the top of their conference while Drexel was 1-5. and five. They may have had a few bad losses, but Drexel's losses were worse. Ryder, William & Mary, they lost to VCU twice and they lost to Old Dominion twice. More importantly, Old Dominion gets in before Drexel does. Old Dominion was on that winning streak. They've had some key wins. But I'm not sure that they've had as many good wins, maybe, as Drexel. Now, Jay, you say you always say reasonable minds can differ. Let's see if they do. What about the Dragons in or out? Well, I have Drexel in. You're right, Jay. They are 0-4 versus the top teams in their conference. But look at the wins, Jay, against Syracuse, Villanova, and also Creighton on the road. I have them out. I think those losses to Drexel, when you look at what they're doing now, they can't lose to Old Dominion twice and say, have Old Dominion sit out and Drexel go in. I agree with you, Jay. So you've got them both out. But, I mean, I, listen, I respect this team. I think it should be in. But it's not in before Old Dominion. That's the only point I'm making. You leave Old Dominion out, then Drexel's got to be sitting right beside him in the NIT because that ain't right. They've lost to Ryder, William & Mary, VCU, Penn, Old Dominion twice. That means out. 
unless Old Dominion's in first. The one thing that you wonder, the strength of schedule non-conference has been in the top five all season. The committee's asked teams to go out and do that, and they've done it. Think that could sway them in their favor, James? Absolutely. They're, they're taking one of them. The committee's proven they're going to take quality mid-majors, so they're taking one of those, too, no question. Okay, aside from the mid-major, a high major sitting squarely on the bubble, the Stanford Cardinal in or out? I have Stanford in. They have to be in there. Five wins over the top 50, beat UCLA, Virginia, the only team to win at Virginia, and 10-8 and eight in the Pac-10 Conference. I have Stanford in. If you look at the Old Dominion directs on Stanford, and there's one bid left, it goes to Stanford. Yes, they beat Oregon, Washington State, UCLA, Southern Cal, and at Virginia, but if I look at the Anthony Goods, Brooke Lopez, Lawrence Hill, and I want to face those guys, I'd rather play Drexel or Old Dominion. Well, they're in the NIT, so you'd be playing there, according to all this stuff. But but Stanford should be in. The, the paper says they should probably be out, but I think they should be in. All those wins against the quality teams we've mentioned, that's a quality basketball team that's played a good schedule. I think they deserve to be in. And we talked to Trent Johnson earlier, and he mentioned they also had the injury to Anthony Goods that might have uh, watered down their record just a little bit. Stanford's team is sitting on the bubble awaiting in the next few minutes to find out if they're going to be in or out of the NCAA tournament. All also, high major team, Florida State, very interesting case for the Seminoles in or out. I have Florida State out, but they could definitely be in. They beat Florida in Duke, but they lost six of their last nine games. They were without their starting point guard, Tony Douglas. They had to beat North Carolina to solidify their birth. It's the way they lost to North Carolina. I think that didn't help them all. They're definitely out. And looking at what goes on in the ACC this year, the best conference in the country, you can't be 7-9 and nine and look for a bid. Well, thinking what the committee will do, I think the committee will say that Florida State will be out. So I'll go that way as well. But look, they, they've beaten Florida, they've won at Duke, they beat Maryland, they beat Virginia Tech, Providence. Eight of their losses came on the road, including losses to Wisconsin and Pitt. This team challenged itself, and according to what we are saying about Drexel, Absolutely. why in Florida State in? Absolutely. Leonard Hamilton telling us today, once again, another team had a key injury, Tony Douglas. They went one and four in a stretch without their point guard. He came back, Seminoles played better, but Digger mentioned did not play well against North Carolina and Florida State, which last year became just the second ACC team to win nine conference games and not get invited to a tournament when the field has been at least 64 teams could have a 20-win season this time around and also be left on the outside. Much more to come on Bracketology. Not too far away from the field of 65 being unveiled. We'll continue to talk in or out when we come back. ESPNU Bracketology is presented by Staples. That was easy. to ESPNU Bracketology, presented by Staples. All during championship week, these are the games that drive the bubble sitters crazy. Wright State beating Butler in the Horizon League on Tuesday. Butler a shoe in for, for an at-large bid on Friday. Utah State knocked out Nevada in the WAC semifinals. Nevada's going to get in as an at-large. Saturday, George Washington won the 8-10 automatic bid. Xavier thought to be an at-large team. I'm not so sure they're not getting a free pass. We'll talk about them in a bit. What about West Virginia? Interact. Well, I had West Virginia in with all the upsets. They have to be out. They're 9-7 and seven in the Big East. They had big wins over UCLA and Villanova, but you look at their non-conference schedule, not good, and they had to beat. They had an opportunity to beat Louisville. I have them out only because of what went on in their schedule in the Big East. Yes, they're 9-7, but they had an easy schedule in the Big East. They didn't have to play enough of the tougher teams. Even though they beat UCLA, they're out. Yeah, I think they're out as well. I think West Virginia is a good enough team to be included in the field, but I don't think they have enough quality wins. They've got two wins against the top 20 in UCLA and Villanova. After that, you've got to go down in the 70s to DePaul, Providence, North Carolina State. I want to, I want to clarify, too. Hubert's changed his mind on West Virginia. I'm allowed to do that. Uh, yes, you are. I'm just <laughs> clarifying because the screen said in, you want him out. So 
West Virginia <laughs> out, according to our guys. What about Air Force on a bit of a losing streak? Well, Air Force has to be out. They've lost four straight, two and four against the top team. They lost six uh, games in their conference. Their only the best wins are Texas Tech, Stanford, and Santa Clara. Yeah, they're definitely out. When you look at BYU as well as UNLV, they were the two best teams in the conference. Air Force had a collapse at the end of the season. They are out. You know, it's funny. Earlier in the year, I thought Air Force was an absolute lock. They've beaten Vegas. They also beat GW, a tournament team, Long Beach State, San Diego State. But they're four and six over their last ten, including a first-round loss in their tournament. I don't think Air Force is going to make it, and I think the committee is going to leave them out. Air Force 23 and 8. The strength of schedule has been pretty good, but only one top 50 win. Their non-conference strength of schedule in the top 25 in the country. All right, we'll continue counting down for the unveiling of the brackets. You can see it on Sports Center coming up top of the hour. We'll be here to take a look at the brackets, break them down, talk about the teams that are snubbed as we look forward to the unveiling of the field of 65. North Carolina planning on being a one seed in the NCAA tournament. These guys think there might be some controversy for the final number one seed. Ohio State finished its season prior to the tournament with a little emphasis. from Siemens can be found everywhere. By integrating communications, building technologies, and advanced medical systems, we're creating digital hospitals that can provide higher quality patient care. Siemens, we're turning dreams into reality. Now just minutes away from unveiling the field of 65, number one and two seeds, according to Joe Lenardi, our bracketologist. He's got Ohio State, UCLA, North Carolina, and Kansas locking up one seed, Florida finishing just off that top line. Our guys will talk about their one seed and who should get the one seed on Sports Center coming up in a bit. ESPNU Bracketology is presented by Staples. That was easy. Sports Center coming up in a matter of minutes. We'll show you the field of 65. Our guys will break down the decisions, not only the one seed, the teams that got snubbed, and then all kinds of depth and analysis. We'll talk to the tournament committee chairman, Gary Walters, on ESPNU Bracketology, presented by Staples at 7 Eastern time. Sports Center is on the way. Center alongside Matt Weiner. I'm Neil Everett. Let's dance. First, <laughs> let's pick the full field of 65. The surprises, the snubs, and reactions from the analysts you've been watching all season long are all coming up. But up top, some last minute business in the Big 12. Kevin Durant, Texas, Horns and Hawks. Kansas trying to nail down a number one seed, the defending champs, but had to deal with that guy. Kevin Durant, sublime. The three pointer goes. Durant, just as he was in the semifinal, added early. The NBA three will go. Get used to it. Three of seven from out there. He had 22 in the first half. Texas led by as many as 22. Still in the first, it's Brandon Rush as Kansas mounts the comeback. Remember, they had won 10 straight games coming into this. They go on a 15 3 run. Sharon Collins to Daryl Arthur for the baseline dunk. Kansas down four at the break. Second half, Durant. Jumper goes. First field goal since 7.20 left in the first half. His team up by three. Rush, Trey, Ben. Kansas down one. They would take the lead on free throws. Collins drives. Oh, the reverse is good. Hanging and hitting. Using the body and the rim. 69-65. Collins had 20. Texas down three. Durant, short jumper, bump and bucket. He was 12 of 30 from the field. He had 37. Kansas down two. Off the rim, loose ball. Mario Chalmers and one. 
Kansas up 74-73. Over a minute to go. Texas up by one. Numbers not looking good. A.J. Abrams knocks down the three. Texas leads it 78-74. Chalmers goes around the screen and knocks down the three ball to tie it at 79 with 15 seconds left. Chalmers clutch 17 points. Durant chance to win it on the baseline. The turnaround won't go. And check out the last second heave. Front rimmed it. We're headed overtime in the OT. Russell Robinson. Just above the free throw line, he'll knock that down. Kansas up 83-81. Kansas up three. DJ Augustine drives. Brandon Rush knocked to the floor. Ball out to Durant. Augustine rushed off the floor in time to block the shot. He kept that. A good hustle. Kansas wins it 88-84. to They've now won 11 straight and won the Big 12 30 two years in a row. All right, is Kansas a one seed with that win? Will Wisconsin get a one seed if it beats Ohio State? Big 10 championship. Cameron Taylor, four-point game, but Orlando Tucker had just 10 points in this game. Greg Oden, talk to the hand. He had 12, 10, and four blocks. Mike Conley had 18. Lewis was 17, and here when Conley misses, you know who's there to follow. It's Oden, and Ohio State wins 66-49, so they are looking like a one. Oh, let's cut down the nets and dance, too. All right. Battle for number one seed, Sydney Lowe and NC State hoping to cap their improbable ACC tourney run. Courtney Fells, the leaner. NC State down one, Fells had 19. Just over four minutes to go, NC State down five off the missed free throw. Ben McCauley, board stick back. He had 12. The lead is three. Next Carolina possession, Rayshon Terry to his right. From right about there, he knocks down the three. Carolina wins 78-72. They win at 89 to 80. How about the SEC championship? Joe Kim Noah, they're hoping to turn it, turn a victory over Arkansas into another eventual national championship. Al Horford. Man, M-A-N. He had 18. He was your tourney MVP. Corey Brewer to Noah. He had 17. It was all Florida. Arkansas couldn't throw it in the ocean standing on the beach in this game. I'm still hungry for more, said Noah afterwards. Florida, big winner, 77 to 56. You're hungry for more. We're going to get you over to Reese Davis, Digger Phelps, and Jay Billis in a moment. Who will be the one seeds in the NCAA tournament? And how will the rest of the field fill out? Sports Center telling you who's going where and how they'll do once they get there. And the NHL says to Simon, sit straight ahead. How long will Chris Simon be benched for that hit? And what does the man he decked think of the punishment? We will reveal the brackets, all 65 teams in just a moment. First, some nuts and bolts of the NCAA tournament. Just to remind you, the field is 65 teams strong, 31 automatic bids, 34 at-large selections by the committee. The second weekend, they'll be paired down to four sites, the regionals in East Rutherford, New Jersey, St. Louis, San Antonio, and San Jose. Sports Center is the place to be right now. Here's Reese, Digger, and Jay. All right, guys, we know who the number one seeds are right now, and there was a little bit of controversy coming down the stretch as to whether UCLA would be able to hold one of those four number one seeds. So we might as well unveil them right now, guys. It is Florida in the Midwest. It is North Carolina in the East, Kansas in the West, Ohio State in the South. Jay, these are the four teams that you thought would be the number one seeds. However, you look at UCLA. I know they lost their last two games, but they have far more top 25 and top 50 victories than Kansas does. But they're not a conference champion, and I think that's what led into this, is every one of those four number one overall seeds were a conference champion in their conference tournament, which are played on neutral floors. And the best evidence of how a team is going to perform on a neutral floor in a tournament setting is on a neutral floor in a tournament setting. So I think the committee gave deference to the teams, not only that were playing well down the stretch, and all four of these teams were, but teams that won their conference tournaments. UCLA lost their last two games against Washington and against Cal. Neither team going to the NCAA tournament. And the last time a team got a number one seed losing their last two was back in 1991. It's been a while. In fact, it's only happened twice. Digger did it one time in 1979, too. And it's probably worth noting UCLA won the regular season. But as you mentioned, the other team swept both the regular season and the tournament title. What do you think of the four number one seed? Well, I thought UCLA, the strength of the conference, it was the number three ranked conference in the RPI. North Carolina, the ACC was number one. In Florida, the SEC. 
SEC was number two. The Big 12 is ranked seventh in the RPI as a conference. Not even uh, the Missouri Valley is ranked sixth. So when I looked at the strength of the conference and the strength of UCLA season and the fact that this team is back with a lot of good players from last year's national championship team, I think they deserve the number one bid. But the most important thing is now as you look at it, hey, there'll be a two seed probably in the West, and it doesn't matter. Once the, the four number one seeds come out, the last five years, only six of the 20 number one seeds made it to the Final Four. You find it all uh, curious a little bit that uh, Ohio State goes to the South, Florida to the Midwest, the South. I mean, there's no real geographical edge in the South for Florida going to San Antonio. No, they just put them closest. They have a computer program that shows how many miles they are away, and they protect the top seeds and put them as close to their natural region as possible for fans and all that stuff. That's something they've done over the last four years. Okay, and when we get to the Final Four, form will never hold, but if it does, the East will play the South, Midwest will play the West. Those regions will play whoever survives, but those are the top four seats. As we start to look at the bracket unfolding, what are you most looking forward to finding out? I want to see where Memphis is going to be seated. I think they could be seated as high as a two, but they didn't play as tough a schedule, didn't have as much success in the non-conference as they did last year. Last year, they played an extraordinarily difficult non-conference schedule and wound up getting one out of it. I think they're worthy of a number two. The question is, will they get one? And what will they do with UCLA? I agree with Digger. I think they'll be out West. I, I'm looking forward to the 5-12 matchups every year. We just say, oh, the fives won't lose. Next thing you know, there's two upsets by a 12. The other thing is going to be interesting, the 8-9 matchups. Why? Because they could be sitting right in there to knock off a number one seed. If you're talking about some of these teams, that we look at like even a Duke who's going to play well in the tournament, and that's going to be an interesting facet to see how these teams show up in the 8-9 seeds to see if they have the potential to knock off a number one seed in the second round. And I want to know what they're going to do with Drexel and Old Dominion. I don't think both those teams out of the Colonial are going to wind up getting in the tournament, and I think it wi might wind up being Old Dominion that gets left out and Old Dominion beat Drexel twice. They finished higher up in the standings in the CAA and did better against the top teams in the CAA going four and two against the top teams while Drexel went one and five. And I think Drexel is going to get the nod because they played a, a, a lot of away games. And to me, that doesn't make any sense. That, that's just not a fair way to look at it because I think Old Dominion proved they're better during the regular season. Well, Old Dominion, just as you were speaking right then, Old Dominion is in the field of 65. They are in the Midwest in a 5-12 game against Butler. So Old Dominion at 24 and 8. They've made it in, so we'll wait and see now what happens with Drexel and see if the Colonial is able to get three teams in the field of 65. We'll have the rest of the Midwest bracket coming up in just a little while, Neil. All right, fellas, instead of Simon says it was Simon told the rest of the regular season in the playoffs, Chris Simon benched by the NHL for taking his stick high on Ryan Holweg. 25 games, ban carries over to next season if the Islanders play fewer than 25 games this season. Holweg called the suspension fair. It's the longest games ban in the history of the league. Todd Bertuzzi got 20 games plus the playoffs after he false cracked Steve Moore. Moore broke his neck. He's never played again. He's filed a civil suit against Bertuzzi. Tuzzi, who was originally a New York Islander. Marty McSorley got 23 games in 2000 for using his stick as a weapon on Donald Brashear. McSorley was convicted of assault, given an 18-month conditional discharge, never played another NHL game. Brashear, by the way, said of Simon, quote, I'm sure after it happened, he looked at himself and said, what the hell am I doing? Rounding on our men behaving badly and paying the price, Dale Hunter missed the start of the 93-94 season while serving a 21-game suspension for the blindside check on Pierre Turgeon, who was an Islander. Still ahead on SportsCenter, Selection Sunday's cruelest cuts. We'll tell you which bubble clubs are breathing a sigh of relief tonight and which are gasping for air. Plus a day after a breakdown, the comeback. Ron Artest returns to basketball for the first time since last week's arrest. $11. Blanket, $24. Making it all better. Priceless. With PayPass on your MasterCard, just tap and go. Man, what a finish for the Southland Conference. Texas A&M Corpus Christi against Northwestern State. It's a two-point game. Final seconds and Tyran Mitchell feeding it to Kevin Menifee off the steal and Corpus Christi up four. We're, we're going to the dance. Well, hey, he's 
easy, easy. Because Luke Rogers drills a three with about less than three seconds left. So now we got some free throws and Northwestern State's gonna have one more chance and we've seen stranger things happen. Just not in this game we haven't. The Islanders, an independent before this season. They can get an NCAA tournament bid. All right, there are those who have said Arkansas not a lock for the tournament. Now beating Florida would lock up their date in the field of 65. We showed you that Florida and Joe Kim Noah are a one seed. Gives you an indication the way this highlight's gonna go. Noah, yes sir. Up six, Arkansas. Picked a bad day to stop sniffing three-pointers. Patrick Beverly, 0 for 6 from the field in the first half. This will make Billy Donovan's heart go pitter, pitter, pitter. Al Horford turns an ankle. And he'd have to go to the locker room, and if you think he's out, well, you don't know Tito's son. Final seconds, first half. Beverly, no. Arkansas, 1 for 15 from 3 in the first half. They trail by 8 at the break. Second half. He's back, he's big, and he, he's bad. Horford, one ankle injury. He had 18 points, 12 rebounds. He's your tournament MVP. And then Noah, the strip, and he goes coast to coast. 77 to 56, no pig suey for Arkansas in this game. What about in the field? Let's head back to the fellas who've got some ideas. All right, Neil, Arkansas is still waiting, but Florida is not. The Gators sewed up their number one seed after a little bit of a late regular season swoon. They were impressive in the SEC tournament. They are the number one seed in the Midwest region trying to work their way towards St. Louis. They'll open up against Jackson State. Then a potential second round game, assuming that they get past that first round game against the winner of Arizona and Purdue. We've been saying for a while, Jay, that those eight, nine matchups with those high majors that are talented but maybe underachieved a little bit in Arizona's case could be dangerous. I can't remember a number eight seed that's as talented as Arizona is. I mean, that's an amazing seed for a team that was once thought to be a Final Four contender out of the gate, a top five team, and Arizona clearly didn't perform as well as we thought they would throughout the season, but they're playing a team in Purdue that I think may be the hardest working team in America. Carl Landry inside, one of the best low post scorers, not only in the Big Ten, but in the country, and David Teague is a guy that can go off on you for 25 if he gets hot from three. 5-12 matchup in the Midwest is Butler and Old Dominion, and the 4-13 is Maryland against Davidson. Now, Davidson, a very capable team under Bob McKillop, but Maryland down the stretch has been one of the hotter teams in America, Dicker. Yeah, Davidson will play that half-court game. They'll want to play the zone. They'll try to force Maryland to bad shots, but Maryland, if they play the pressure defense and they know how to go up and down, and, and you know what DJ Strawberry's done ending his season as strong as he did trying to get it going. I know they lost in the first round of the conference tournament, but this is a very dangerous Maryland team. Um, our, our best point guard in the country, the freshman, our guy the Gr Grievous Vasquez. Grievous yeah. Vasquez. Uh, the way he can dish it and dump it off. Beckway's a key. He's got to play big on the boards, but this is a very dangerous game for Maryland to play. But if they force the up-tempo game and they use their pressure defense, which is their best running game, I think Maryland can pull this off. Bottom half of that bracket in the Midwest. You know you know how the committee always says they're not clever enough to come up with the subplots and how, how they really don't listen to the talking heads? The 6-11 matchup is for you. Can you believe that? Notre Dame and Winthrop, the 6-11 <laughs> matchup. The reason I bring it up, well, uh, the obvious Notre Dame connection, and Digger has been saying for weeks, Winthrop's going to get somebody. Winthrop's <laughs> going to win a first-round game. Big South has never won a first-round game, and here they are, the Eagles against the Irish. In preseason, I'm looking at all these schools. I'm saying Winthrop's going to make a statement this year. Why? Well, they lost to Gonzaga two years ago by nine. Last year, they lose in the first round and a buzzer shot to Tennessee, and they Played at Wisconsin, lost by three in overtime in the preseason NIT. They lose at Carolina by seven. So, Terrell Martin and company, this team's been my team all year long. And who do they play? Thanks, committee. They're playing the Irish um, <laughs> out in Spokane. But I think this Notre Dame team. think they did really, that to you? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, no. I do. I, I, I do. Oh, I'm, but, pretty, I'm pretty convinced of it. <laughs> well, let me say this, though. Finishing it up on this, I, I just think when you look at the Irish, Mike Bray has done his best coaching job at Notre Dame. And have the two freshmen, when you look at Luke Herringote and how he's become so powerful inside and the little freshman point guard Tory Jackson not just scoring points but getting six or eight assists a game getting six or eight rebounds a game to go with Colin Falls and what Russell Carter can do Notre Dame should really just take care of business and get by this first round match. All right, let, let me give you the rest of the matchups here in the Midwest we've got Oregon as the three seed against Miami Ohio Miami Ohio by the way the only automatic qualifier with fewer than 20 wins this season UNLV is the seven seed they take on Georgia Tech from the ACC and then Wisconsin against Texas A&M Corpus Christi Let's take a broader look now at the Midwest. You have Florida, Wisconsin, Oregon as the top three.
three seeds. What do you think of the bracket overall? I think the best game could wind up being if Notre Dame and Oregon survive their first round matchups to see those two teams who really spread the floor, shoot a lot of threes because Oregon is playing extraordinarily well. And I think Oregon's big guys are just as capable as Notre Dame's, maybe a little bit better. Marty Lunan is, is, I think, vastly overrated. A guy that can step out and knock a three down. He can also post a very good rebounder. And Bryce Taylor playing as well as any two guard in America. You, you put that trio of guards together for Oregon. They're going to be very hard for Notre Dame to guard. And I don't think Notre Dame, if they get that far, is going to be able to play a lot of zone against Oregon because Oregon can really shoot. The interesting matchup is where does Wisconsin go as a two seed? They really struggled against Ohio State today. They didn't shoot the ball well. And when you look at Orlando Tucker and, and Cameron Taylor, if those two guys aren't hot, they didn't rebound well against Ohio State. Ohio State just beat them up inside. This team is supposed to be one of those teams that can move forward. Bo Ryan has some work to do to get this team back on track. This was not a good game the way they played against Ohio State and well, lost today. Well, but Digger, one of the reasons that they didn't look good is they played against Greg Oden. If they can get away from Greg Oden, and they have, <laughs> I think they'll do a lot better. They, the, the poorest that they've looked all season long is against the, in the games against Ohio State, and I think that that 7-2 guy in the middle has a lot to do with it. Well, that. Michigan State, they got a rebound at 41-24, so uh, that's an issue for them. Rebounding and points in the paint with a true center, and if those guys aren't shooting the ball on the, on the perimeter, that could be their downfall. All right, that's the Midwest bracket that has been unveiled as those teams are trying to get to St. Louis for the regional semifinals and finals. Up next, the West bracket. We'll break it down in just a bit, Matt. All right, Reese, the man who once trimmed his hair to reveal the words true warrior was reduced to tears yesterday. Ron Artest, speaking to reporters for the first time since his arrest on domestic violence charges, could barely articulate the apology to his family, fans, and franchise. Police picked up Artest last Monday after a woman called 911 from his home, claiming Artest had struck her. With nothing to do legally until an arraignment on the 22nd, the Kinks decided to have Artest play. In the meantime, Artest back on the court after two excused absences. Nuggets in town looking for their first win in Sacramento since 1997. Marcus Camby to Allen Iverson there knocked down the jumper, but he would sour on the officials. Thought he got fouled there, then went ahead and committed his third. He's got something to say about it. First of all, I'm not 100% in love with your tone right now. He's teed up, spent much of the first half on the bench in foul trouble. In the third, Denver up by 10. Iverson back door. Marcus Camby on the other end. He had 16. Nuggets up by 12. Mike Bibby keeping the home team in it. Knocks down the three. Three of his 34. Sacramento back within nine. But off the bad pass by Bibby, it's Iverson starting the break. Two of his 24 got the foul as well. Denver up 73 66. Then off the Iverson miss, it's Meadow. The putback. He had 29. Denver up by 10. Steve Blake then to Linus Klaza. Hey, one Missouri Tiger had a great selection Sunday. A season and career high 24 for Klaza. Our test 17 points, eight boards in 39 minutes. Check out the Pistons and the Clippers. No Rasheed Wallace, so it's going to be a rip of Rip Hamilton, who, by the way, is, is second on the Detroit squad in technicals. Hamilton, Piston up five right there. He had 15 of his 23 in the first quarter. More Hamilton in the first, and then in the second quarter here. Made his first eight shots, finished 10 of 12 on the game. Closing moments of the first half, Chauncey Billups, 12 assists and 17 points. Mr. Big Shot right there, Detroit up four at the half, and then Chris Weber has proved to be a valuable addition to this club. Tayshawn Prince misses 11 rebounds, 19 points for C-Web, 98 to 80, Detroit. More bracketology results are straight ahead. The rest of the field revealed. The Sports Center selection Sunday continues. Who's in, who's out, and all the rest. And until last season, most Red Sox fans didn't know the name Daisuke Matsuzaka. Now they're scrambling to ID the two guys who took him deep today. My dream was always to catch the perfect wave. And then I realized I caught three. The all-new Lincoln MKX with all-wheel drive. The perfect car for endless summers. Life's calling. Where to next?
the top of the hour, ESPN News Bracketology, sponsored by Staples. Everything you could possibly need to know about the field of 65, not to mention 66, 67, 68, 69. But why wait when we can find out what's up in the West right now? All right, Matt, in the West, the number one seed, Kansas. They won the Big 12 regular season and won a thriller on ESPN a little while ago against Texas to win the Big 12 tournament. The Jayhawks will open play against Niagara. They are or the Florida A&M Niagara winner. That is from the opening round game. Let's not call it a play-in game. And then a potential 8-9 matchup against the winner of Kentucky and Villanova. Another one, Jay, of those 8-9 games that is producing some high majors that are dangerous. Yeah, that is going to be a dangerous game. If they wind up playing Villanova because Villanova has some tough matchups, I, I still think Kansas is the more explosive, the better, the deeper team. They certainly have more size, so I wouldn't expect that they would have too much of a problem. It's going to be an issue, but I think Kansas is the better team. All right, also in the upper half of the bracket, in the West, the 5-12 matchup is Virginia Tech against Illinois. Illinois slipping in 4-13 Southern Illinois against Holy Cross. You're surprised, Hubert, to see the Illini in the field of 65. I really am surprised about Illinois. I mean, this is a team that was 9-7 and seven in uh, the Big Ten, but they played a great non-conference schedule, but they didn't beat anybody. And when they look at them in the Big Ten, they only played Ohio State and Wisconsin once. And then when you look at that head-to-head -head matchup against Purdue, they had the same resumes, 9-7 and seven in the regular season. They both lost in the semifinals of the conference tournament. I thought they had to take Purdue. I'm really interested in why they let Illinois in. Well, they did take Purdue in one of the other regions. I mean, I was a little bit surprised